Good morning. This is the Real Estate and Open Space Committee meeting for November 18th, 2022. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Can I have a motion? I move. Second. Still open the meeting? Yeah. Why not? Really? You, yeah. you can just call it. You can just, okay. you can just open the meeting. <laughs> Could you just have gone along with it? I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I make a motion to open the meeting. Well, you know. All right. Um, we need to approve the minutes of the regular session from October 21st, 2022. I'll make uh, a motion to accept the minutes. Oh, good. Thank you. Is there a <laughs> of October 21st, 2022. Okay. Is there any discussion? No. Nope. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, just a note, we did have executive session minutes, but we will do them at the next uh, meeting when we have an executive session. Okay. I'd like to welcome our guests. Would you like to introduce yourselves to uh, everyone? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I'm Wendy Cullinan. I'm the president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Cape Cod. Welcome, Wendy. <clears throat> and I'm Beth Wade. I'm the director of land acquisition and project development for Habitat for Humanity of Cape Cod. Thank you for having us. Yeah, welcome, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Uh, I was there yesterday for the dedication um, for the houses on Murray Lane. It was lovely. It, it really was wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm glad you were able yeah. to make it. The houses were really very nice. I yes. mean, yeah, yeah. The more people that come, the happier we are because we really want people to see the you know our product because yeah. we're very proud of the home we build. It's very yeah, it was well very built. Nice. I wouldn't mind moving in myself. I uh, know we all say the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, nice. Know, yeah. um, so we've invited you today uh, to do a presentation, you know, fill us in on uh, who you are, how you do it, what you do. Yeah. Great. So, well, thanks. So I'll start. So, um, all right. So great. Thank you. And um, we have to advance this ourselves. And Beth, you want to do yeah, the advancing? Do okay. So, so this is actually here on the, this picture is um, the cup, one of the families that is purchasing one of the homes on Murray Lane in Harwich, and um, we we kind of like to kind of trick people, surprise people, because for these six homes that we built, we had about 70 plus applications. So um, eventually, everyone that qualifies does go into a paint can. We use a paint can, and we pull their names out one by one. But we, what we do is we say, you know what? There's some paperwork you didn't sign. If you could just pop in the office to sign one more thing, and then we surprise them and say, surprise! Here's balloons and flowers, and you're actually going to be building your home. And um, within you know 12 months, usually this was longer, but usually within about 12 months, um, they get to move in. So um, that's Jessica and Charles, and their their son um, Axel. No, go ahead, right ahead, Beth. So our mission statement, I know you all can read. Can just move on from that. This is a, a home that we finished last year. Um, is this, yeah, this is down in Orleans on Quonset. Um, a two bedroom ranch, very typical of what we build. A lot of our homes are either two bedroom or three bedroom ranches or, or a one, two or three bedroom cape. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of conversation going on right now about density, and um, we're very much aware of that. And it's actually something we've been doing all along. So we, you know, where we built these six homes in uh, Harwich that we dedicated last night with typical zoning, and it would have been one home. So, um, you know, we were able to build six homes there. So that is what is needed: is these small pocket neighborhoods of starter homes, and you know, things that our generations before were able to, you know get into a starter home, their first small home that they could own. And as you all know, I don't have to tell you, that's just impossible right now on Cape Cod. So, And you know, um, it didn't feel the, the, the density. It didn't, it just seemed like a nice little cold I know. sec, you I, know, not, uh, yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. And we're very deliberate about that too. We don't just go line them up, boom, 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 boom. You know, right. We try to put a few different styles in and angle them a little differently so it doesn't scream affordable home. You know, we don't want that. It's just, unfortunately, it's a negative label, just like 40B is a negative, you know, people, the knee-jerk reaction to that term 40B is negative. Um, it actually is the tool we use to do something like what you saw last night, six small, well-built homes for these, these working families that are, you know, really and truly going to change but Wendy, their lives. Wendy, was this an anomaly, the Orleans one? Because it is just one standing yeah, house. It, it's an yes. adorable house. I've gone by it many yes. times. It's a nice little yeah. setting. 
Yeah, it is. It's an adorable home, and um, it's not our first choice by any means. You know, the 6 to 10 is really a, a better model for us financially, obviously. But the town of Orleans, and Beth can speak to that. Actually, right now, if you want to speak to how that sure. came about, just Beth. That the Orleans Housing Trust uh, approached us. They wanted to have a home, a habitat home, and there wasn't any other land available, Kathy. So what we did is we sought out a lot. And so we did purchase the lot with um, housing trust funds and built the house there. So, so a single family house is not out of the question or maybe a duplex or something on a, right. a lot. Yeah. I think the right. key, and Wendy can speak to this if she wants to correct anything I'm saying, but um, I think the key is with this particular single lot, they gave us a lot of latitude for timing of the build. So it, we were able to squeeze it in. We had completed a build, weren't quite ready to move on to the larger build, and then we were able to put it into the schedule. And it happened actually um, much quicker than any of us had anticipated. They'd give us, given us five years to do it, mm -hmm. to start it. And we started it, what, within a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just yeah. happened that way. Yeah. But it was comfort for <laughs> us to know we had that flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so this um, is what we're up to right now. Um, we've completed 165 homes on Cape Cod. Um, currently, the six in Harwich would bring that up to 171. We have 10 homes in Falmouth that um, we're going to complete this February or March. <laughs> So those 10 families right now are out right in the middle of you know, their, their sweat equity hours and getting those homes built. We have two in Chatham that will finish in the spring. Um, the three in Sandwich, uh, the foundations are in. Uh, two homes in Brewster are- um, Permits issued. Permits issued. <laughs> <laughs> it does. On Monday. And that's wonderful. Um, so that's a, that's a beautiful story. So this is a homeowner, um, Beth Finch, who contacted Beth to say that um, I am willing to divide up my, my property and offer two Habitat homes to be built here. She donated land right next door. I mean, the very opposite of a NIMBY, like right, right next door. Um, so she just wanted that message to, you know, get out to the community, like there are things we can do. Um, one of those homes is gonna be a veterans build in honor of one of our volunteers who passed away uh, two years ago, Bob Harding. Um, and then we just heard, Wellfleet, we just heard Tuesday mm -hmm. that the four homes that have been in litigation for 15 years, the neighbors have been opposing these four homes in Wellfleet. And we were in court last April, and they, um, there was no appeal after the judge's ruling. Um, so we were gonna start those four homes down in Wellfleet. Um, not exactly sure when that start will happen. Truro is difficult, up in the air still. Uh, Beth has been working with both Dennis, the town of Dennis and the town of Yarmouth, and those are both moving forward really nicely for four homes in Dennis and seven. six to eight. Yep, is that seven? Seven in Dennis? Mm -hmm. No, seven oh. in Yarmouth, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what? That was good. Um, four in Dennis and it will be seven in Yarmouth. We were saying six to eight, so seven is, yeah. is the answer. Thank you, Beth. Um, so this is busy, as busy as we've ever been, um, where you know, we, we, we recognize the crisis that's going on on Cape Cod. We know we're not the answer, but we're certainly one of the answers. And these are you know, a life-changing, lifelong difference being made in, in the lives of these, these families. Um, so you know, some of our foundation principles, sweat equity, the families all put in 250 hours per adult of what we call sweat equity. Um, what I always say when I have these, these, these opportunities to speak is I raised three children and I did not have an extra 10 hours for about 20 years. <laughs> so for them to get 250 hours uh, per adult, um, helping to build not only their homes, but they help build their neighbors' homes so that you know it's all these layers of, of habitat, it's not just wooden nails, right? It's these, these families that are getting to know each other for 12 or 15 months, um, making bonds, children, you know, getting to know each other, and this is all happens before they move in, before their neighbors. So they already, already have this strength in their own communities um, before, they, before they move in. 
Um, and then engaging the community. Well, you know, I mean, this is the best sense of community where these volunteers, I, hundreds of volunteers helped to build those six homes that we dedicated last night. Um, the homeowners are required to take um, finance classes, home maintenance classes. They have one-on-one um, -on -one budget sessions with a local banker. Um, you know, we, we, we weave the education of being a homeowner into our program and, um, and it's very successful. It's, they're really required to, you know, some, sometimes they say, why didn't someone teach me how to do a budget like 10 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Because that's so, so we try to um, set them up for success in, in all ways possible. Um, you can see the home prices, they're very, very affordable. Um, it costs us now probably a little over $300,000 to build a home, so we do a lot of fundraising, and the CAPE is very generous and supportive of our work. Can, can, um, I, just, can I just do is, Does that include land costs, or is it just construction? Yeah, just that's construction. just our construction costs, yeah, that's without the land. Um, and the, so the homes are affordable in perpetuity. <coughs> There's a rider on the deed. No one can flip a home. Um, they, you know, the, if it goes back on the market, it has to go through an, uh, an affordable housing agency to be sure that that deed is, is recognized. <clears throat> so um, qualifications, the first qualification is, uh, has always been families need to earn less than 65% of the median income of Barnstable County. We went to our board, um, I don't know, eight or 10 months ago, mm -hmm. And um, they voted to raise that to 80% of area median income because we're recognizing that level of you know, workers on the Cape that maybe they, they don't qualify for any services at all and are also struggling um, with home ownership. Yep. How do you measure income on Cape Cod? Are you talking about people who are gainfully employed versus the retirees who so, cash flow? So once a year, um, HUD issues area median income and Beth, can you speak to how it's how it's calculated? Because it did go up quite a bit <coughs> this year because there's more people. I think that we used to be second homeowners made it their primary right. home. Right. So um, each year, HUD analyzes the data for the Cape and they look at the in income. And so they come to a point, the median income, which is you know the middle point. Of course, there's. 50% higher and 50% lower, so to speak. Um, and so that point is set. And for us, those of us who are in the affordable housing world, then you would calculate, you would adjust that income based on family size. And there's a chart, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, I can email it to Elaine, um, that shows the income that is the top income at 80% and so you work from there according to eligibility and so there's a whole formula you use but it's calculated that way so this year the income if I'm remembering it correctly the area median income for Barnstable County was a hundred and fifteen thousand yeah, six yeah, and it went up from that's a, a lot of over, it's over a lot of money right. it's a lot of money so what we do because we recognize that it's kind of, um, you know, there may be an inaccuracy around that number. We make adjustments to keep these homes affordable. So we typically, what is allowable is that we can um, allow for a price that is 30% of a person's income. We target 25% and generally, so 25% of a person's income goes towards housing costs, but we typically, it's lower than 25% in many of the categories that we've set up. And again, we have a chart that shows very specifically these figures. And um, our homes, the prices that you're seeing that we say are up to 80%, that home is actually affordable to a person targeting 65% of area median income. And the 60% price would be affordable to someone at 45% of area median income. So we're adding in extra affordability, again, targeting for successful home ownership through the years. And, and, and creating, um, 
really secure housing tenure for these folks with an ability through the years to really become uh, meaningful contributors to our economy. Thank you, Beth. You're welcome. Um, so the, so um, the families have to show need. Um, we don't want anyone to, to trick us, and we know people might try to trick us and say, you know, we, don't, we only earn this much or we don't work, whatever. Um, but we do um, require a lot of documentation. We see, you know, pay stubs and um, tax returns for three years back. Um, we visit the families in their current living situation. We don't want it to be a case where, you know, your mom's sick of you laying out at the pool all day, go get a habitat. <laughs> That's not who we're building here. And believe me, when we visit applicants in their current living situation, we see some very dire situations. I think people would be surprised to think people are living in these conditions on Cape Cod, but we see very poor conditions. A lot of families doubled and tripled up. I'll share a story for someone we built with last year. Um, these three little adorable boys, mom, dad. Um, every time they took a shower, the sewer would bubble up or the septic would bubble up in their backyard. Um, their heat would only stay on for an hour. They would have to reset it, it would spark. You know, there's no, for a family of five, they couldn't find anywhere else to live. This is on Cape Cod. This is happening on Cape Cod. People sleeping on dining room floors, on mattresses, mm -hmm. you know, families of five all in one room. So, mm -hmm. um, so we do. We do visit, and we have teams that go out. If a team comes back and says we don't think they, you know, qualify, we send a second team out. We need to get two no's before we would disqualify a family on need. Um, reliable income. So we, you know, these families are going to be purchasing their homes. They're going to have a mortgage to pay. We want to make sure that they have steady income so that's that is part of qualifying is to be sure that you have your work history and um, can, can pay your mortgage and the sweat equity is up there and then I mentioned the lottery so so we'll take that say the 70 whatever that applied we have a team of about a dozen volunteers that come in a couple times a week during application season and they're going through and they'll say you know they'll send a letter and say you, you didn't qualify here are the reasons why and then if there's a program you look at hack might have a program that you would qualify for perhaps you don't make enough income to qualify for a habitat home that's typical as well um, so then it whittles down so we might whittle it down to 30 or 20 something names that are then put in the bucket we draw every single name out of the bucket we keep we keep a list we had a situation in Harwich where the woman who had qualified for one of the homes put in all of her 250 hours of sweat equity. She has two children. Um, her situation changed. She is in a position now where she is going to be moving to Florida for personal reasons. So um, she said, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to purchase my home. I'm going to let you select another family. So we went back to the lottery and, you know, we, we chose the next name and now it's been two years since they applied, so we, now we have to make sure that do they still qualify, what's their current situation. So um, it was actually the third family because two, one didn't qualify anymore and one had already bought a home. Um, but we were able to call a family just like two, three weeks ago and say, not only are you the next, you know, did you, were you taken, from, pulled from the lottery, but your home's already built and you'll be able to move in before Christmas. This is a mom, dad, and two kids. Like, they could not. I can't believe it. It's like winning the lottery without a doubt. Now they're still going to have to do their 250 hours of sweat equity. Um, they'll have to go to Sandwich or Chatham or Falmouth and, and get their hours in. Um, we'll make sure that they do that before they can purchase their home. But I will allow them to move in we, with our use and occupancy agreement so they'll be able to move in and pay rent until they get their hours done and their USD mortgage gets processed. So that's kind of a nice really that's Thanksgiving, wonderful. Christmas story. Yeah. Um, um, and who we build for. So, um, you know, affordable housing, low income, people have that thought that they're going to be like, I don't know, drinking and using drugs and so, you know, and that's not the case. So we know who our families are and I, I can just, right now, when I go around and think, you know, this woman works for an eye doctor, this woman works for Gosnell, this woman works for the town of Mashpee, you know, just like these are People are working people in our community that, that need these homes, and we need them. Mm -hmm. We need them on Cape Cod to, to have a, a, a thriving community. 
Oh. Um, and this, I turn over to Beth <laughs> at Land Acquisition. And I'll, I'll go through this quickly, but I'm gonna stand up. I've had a problem with my napkin doing that. Mm. Oh, it's irritating it a little bit. So, um, so here we are, right, at the, uh, the right committee as we're talking about land, and it does all start with the land. And so most of you already know this, and I'll just go through it very quickly, but <clears throat> we identify land uh, in a number of ways. I think the biggest um, partner are towns. And I work really closely with planners and assessors and uh, affordable housing committees and others in the identification of what's going to become available. And in that particular situation, it's really helpful, I think, for both the municipality and for Habitat if we can get in in the preliminary discussions um, at whatever point the town feels is appropriate because it helps perhaps to um, whittle out, weed out what may not work for Habitat, but also how can Habitat potentially fit in if there's a mixed use type of development coming online. And by that I mean one that may be uh, multi-income levels or, you know, there's a desire to put Wendy said it earlier, she said we recognize, you know, we're, we're not necessarily the solution, we're a part of it. And so we recognize very clearly the need for rental units, but we also recognize the need for home ownership and what we can contribute to a community, particularly with regard to family housing. So <clears throat> there's a few projects across the Cape where I'm in conversations with town planners and others about the possibility of Habitat coming in and utilizing some portion of a property for home ownership while another developer is utilizing a portion of the property for rentals. So there's ways potentially um, that a planner or others can bring us together and we can begin to work out a plan of how to develop a property to, together. So we're certainly open to that. <clears throat> the other way, um, as uh, I was stating earlier, we sometimes do purchase market rate, although these last few years that's really become an impossibility, but the Orleans lot was at market rate. And then donated, as Wendy mentioned, uh, like through Beth Finch, <clears throat> excuse me. And we have the situation in Sandwich where we're building three houses and the parcels that those two are on one parcel and one home will be on another that's just about two tenths of a mile down the road. So we're using it as a scatter site project, bringing it under one umbrella for the purpose of local um, uh, preference options. And um, those parcels were donated. They were merged lots that couldn't be used. And so through the 40B process, we unmerged the lots and were able to utilize them. <clears throat> so again, just a little bit about what my role is and what I do once I, we identify a parcel. We go through all of our feasibility studies. We um, have engineers whom we work with and others, uh, you know, um, to determine whether or not it's feasible to build on a particular piece of land. And then um, we go through all of the permitting process, whether we're using uh, local initiative um, for 40B or um, an LAU uh, through special permitting. And then um, we assist, I assist uh, with the building permitting and then help oversee compliance with our director of construction from the point of the building permitting through the CO. So this is important to mention because it comes up a lot in discussion. And as Wendy said, um, people hear 40B, the general public hears 40B and they think of large projects and some of their experiences have not, um, they haven't felt good to the community. But we prefer to utilize 40B, and the primary reason is this, that there's a large body of law behind 40B and decisions and the appeal process. 
So if we're going to get to the point of challenge, we like to know that there's a lot already on the books as to how cases are going to be viewed and determined and decided, and there's a very particular process. So that's the primary reason we prefer to use that over special permitting, which doesn't necessarily have that large body of law behind it. But we're open to it. If there's strong preference in a town to go through special permitting, we will do that. We manage the whole process, as it says, soup to nuts. Um, you know, from the time that we're doing the first neighbor outreach, as it becomes clear that it's going to be a project, different towns have different timing for that. Um, sometimes it's before the LIP application is actually sent in to DHCD. Other times it's at that point during the public comment period that I will meet with neighbors. But I manage that process. Wendy will often come with me and others on the team to have a discussion with the neighbors and let them know what's happening and try to work out any kinks before we get to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and I think most of you know the process. So we go from the start of it to the end um, where we, we get the uh, new units onto the subsidized housing inventory. <clears throat> Here's our design portfolio as it currently exists. And um, some of you have heard this presentation before. Wendy mentioned uh, primarily right now we're building the uh, two or three bedroom ranch, uh, the one or three bedroom cape. Those are our preferred builds right now because they're extremely volunteer friendly. When we move into the larger, for example, the four bedroom colonial, which we built last, I think at Paul Hushway and Brewster. 2017. And <laughs> that actually was our Blitz home because um, as you can imagine, many of our volunteers are older and we don't really want them on that roof. Mm -hmm. And then um, we pop into a blitz home. They might not know. Oh, them. yes, blitz yes. Homes. So a blitz home is a home that we undertake with the uh, uh, Home Builders and Remodelers Association, and they build the home in a week, in five days, <laughs> and it's an amazing community event. So. We, this was at Paul Hush Way, and we just completed a Blitz home at Willett Way in Falmouth. And I think there's some pictures on our website. Yeah, there are. And yeah. so it's really neat, to, yeah, really neat to look at that. So um, we also occasionally um, do a custom design for a lot of reasons, uh, which are probably obvious at this point. Um, it, it's something we don't love to do, but we will consider certainly. And this uh, home was on Glenwood Avenue in Falmouth. Um, two family custom, uh, one day one bedroom on one side. On the left and a three bedroom. And three bedroom on the right. And we needed it to fit into that particular neighborhood. And it's, I was just down in Falmouth having a really nice conversation with, uh, uh, town of Falmouth and so I kind of snuck down it's this tight little lane and it's just awesome <laughs> it was one of those I'm really super proud to work for Habitat so we have two architects um, who Leslie Schneeberger who is on our board of directors and Kurt Raber whose design this is who is on our land strategy group committee um, both are very talented and both are currently working on a density design because we understand the continued need to create denser and denser development and while I think we will always prefer to do um, single standing units, so to speak, homes, we're certainly willing to try to bring them closer and closer together. And so Kurt's been working on kind of a um, modified cottage design, um, even moving more towards, do you all know what a shotgun house is? Mm -hmm. So even moving more towards that 
type of home so you can pull them very close together. I want to say one thing about um, a question that comes up often. We do have to use uh, fee simple for ownership rather than a condominium ownership. And the reason is not that we necessarily are deeply opposed to condo ownership, but USDA is. And they are currently the product of our end buyer's most frequent choice, and they will not uh, provide a mortgage for a home that's a condominium. So just real quick, too, um, I think those of you who were there noted the qu quality of our homes. And I just want to touch on energy efficiency. One thing, uh, the energy efficiency piece was almost an afterthought when we first started out on this path. It was about air quality. And a lot of our children who are coming into homes have lived in inadequate housing, and it's been a real issue with lungs. And so we wanted to work on air quality. And so that was how, <laughs> that was the pathway to net zero efficiencies. And I can certainly have a conversation with any of you at another time about more about this part of the program. But we are now building net possible homes. Our HERS ratings are superior. We were awarded um, an award in May of 2022 from the National uh, ResNet Organization of HERS raters as being the habitat for humanity in the country with the lowest HERS score. So it was quite an amazing accomplishment. We do say net zero possible. As our friend at Pioneer Valley Habitat says, you know, we can model our homes for net zero, but there's the one variable we can't control, and that's our homeowner's use after they move in. But as Wendy mentioned earlier, there's a lot of home buyer education, and certainly there's home education around energy usage. So we are hoping that most will um, have very good results. And we definitely have had reports of many of our homes not having any type of ut electric bill. It's all electric house. From, gosh, you know, sometime around June, end of June, all the way through to January. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty significant. There's the... Hers. <laughs> yeah, that's the program. And then there is a YouTube video. If you would like to um, watch that, I can send that link. And then Wendy's already covered that. Um, a little bit about our funding and where it comes from. We bring a lot of private equity to our projects. Um, certainly, there's some uh, public and community funds through CPC, through FHLB, and others, but um, there's a lot of also habitat equity that we bring to the project, and a primary source, or one very significant source, are our restore sales. Um, we also have had some very generous donors with regard to our green um, environmental attribute program, and um, particularly Ken Foreman and Ann Giblin, who are Falmouth residents, and they've contributed over $300,000 towards that part of our effort. Couldn't do it with any, without any of our generous donors. And um, Murray Lane, uh, it's obviously come a long way since this picture was taken. I better update that. But as we know, it was a glorious uh, celebration yesterday. And uh, so we're at a point where we're looking forward to another Harwich project. So I will leave you with that <laughs> and just say we're very excited about the possibility of working with Harwich again in the future. This has been just a wonderful experience, and we're very appreciative of our partners. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Wendy. Thank you. Uh, anybody have any questions? Or? Um, what provisions do you all put in place to ensure that the, the homes remain affordable? 
So we have a deed rider. We work with DHCD, and we have a regulatory agreement that's put in place. As soon as we receive the comp permit, mm -hmm. we go to the standard form regulatory agreement with DHCD. <clears throat> so it's reviewed by town attorney and um, habitat attorney, and then goes to DHCD. And so that's put on record at the time of the comp permit. Mm -hmm. And then at the sale, um, there, is that, that there is an attachment that DHCD, um, we add their uh, rider to the deed, which ensures the affordability. Okay. So, so if they resell, they can, they, can, they can sell it and get some market appreciation, but it's capped, right? Yes, so um, all of our resales, whether they're purchased at 60% AMI or 80% AMI will be at up to 80% AMI and there is um, a formula as to what yeah. the price can be at the sale. So there is the opportunity to potentially have um, some equity mm -hmm. and of course they're getting back whatever, you know, a portion of whatever they've put in. The mortgage rates are low. Mm -hmm. So the amount of equity that they'll be able to acquire back through a sale is generally very good. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just follow up on that? Uh, do you have an idea of the percentage of homes that become like starter homes, the people then move on, and what percentage of the people make that their forever home or stay a great length of time? You know, um, that's a very good question, Elaine, and I don't have that answer off the top of my head. There, we, we've had, um, so I've worked with Habitat since 2018, and we've had a handful of sales since then, but I don't know the longer history right off the top of my head. But there's some folks who do move on and move up, and there's others who determine, like any of us, that they want to go elsewhere, and that has happened, too, in my experience. I, I thus far, have been handling the majority of the resales. I'm so. just wondering yeah, I, about the stability of some of the yeah, homes I'd that like they to stay sure, for years. I'd like to a little bit to that, um, because we have more recently had some, some resales. Prior to Beth coming on, I think, we only had like less than five. I mean, so overall, you know, the majority of the families choose to stay in their homes. Um, but we, you know, we, we want this starter home to be maybe the answer to someone being more successful in life, right? right? Getting that fresh start mm -hmm. and the ability to thrive. And, you know, having so many homeowners tell us that for years they had to turn down getting a raise because they would lose their daycare vouchers or their subsidies, right? So so there's that, this is like a release from that trap. Mm -hmm. Their mortgage isn't gonna change. They know how mm -hmm. much they have to pay every month. So no matter how their income increases, that doesn't change. So that is, and I'll, and I'll tell Melissa's story, one of my favorite stories. Um, when I first started, I met Melissa, we were dedicating her home down in Truro on Yellow Brick Road. And her story is that she had, uh, she lived in one room with her two children, and she said she was very appreciative to have that room to live in, but she could stand in the center of that room and just about touch each wall. So it was a small place, and that was where they lived, where they ate, played, slept, had friends over. That was it. So, and she was someone who did have to turn down a 50 cent an hour raise, or she would have lost her daycare voucher. She was um, working as a, for a cleaning company, um, out of Provincetown, I think she lived down the, uh, in the Outer Cape. After getting her Habitat home, she now owns her own cleaning company, um, employs 40 workers at the height of the season, and you know she's thriving. She sits on our board of directors. So it's just one example of how you know your your life can change. But but back to your question about how many people are still in their home, I will say we've only had one foreclosure in 30. It'll be 35 years wow. next year. So, um, you know, the, the education is important. Um, but yeah, that we have to update those numbers because mm -hmm. we have had some, some sales recently where people have, and we've also had people paying off their mortgages now, which yeah. is so exciting, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to be able to pay off your mortgage. So there's, it's, it's not, like I said earlier, not just wooden nails. So, you know, you could sell your house and leave somewhere, but you helped to build this house. People helped you build your home. There's a lot of emotion um, to giving up a home that you just didn't go in and you know pick a 
pick out of a town and, and purchase. This is a, a lot more than that. So, anyone else, Kathy? Yeah. So, um, is Habitat? Um, they're not on the deed, right? The deed is in the homeowner's name. That's so correct. What relationship moving forward does Habitat have with the new homeowners? So we, um, one of our tools that we use is we match each family that's selected to build with us. We match them with what we call family partners. So the um, requirements for a family partner is to stay with the family through the build, um, stay in touch with them once a week um, to make sure they're getting in their sweat equity and making sure they're taking their classes and um, you know, kind of being a cheerleader for them. But then we ask that they stay in touch for a full year after the home is purchased because now they're homeowners and a lot of them, their parents weren't homeowners and owning a home comes with a lot of challenges. So they still have this person in their life that you know, can mentor them through you know, getting off on, on the right foot. Um, we have a family services manager. Um, but we, hold, we hold the mortgages for some of our earlier homes. Um, I think it was 2012 we started using USGA mortgages. So for those families that we hold the mortgages, you know, we would see if someone's getting behind, it would be call them in, set them down. The one bill you don't miss is your mortgage. What's going on? So, you know, a little more love than you might get from a bank, right? So, so we're able to, you know, um, work with them to, to get them back on track. So, you know, any, anyone that calls Habitat, if you're a Habitat homeowner, your family, um, some of them never want to hear from us again, and some of them want to volunteer for us. We put out uh, something out on our Facebook. One day last week, we needed um, some painters for the front of our restore in Yarmouth, because we were just trying to give that a facelift. And one of the homeowners from down in Wellfleet, who had built a few years back, came up for the day to spend the day painting, just you know, to show appreciation. So there's a, a relationship that's built, and like anything in life, some, you know, are strong and some, like I said, some people don't, you know, we, what we say is you don't have to be a poster child for Habitat, <laughs> you know, that's, you know, we, we kind of, while we're building, we might ask you to say a few words, but, you know, if you want to be, you know, you don't have to have a stamp. But I would imagine it. that, I mean, in some cases, there might be growing families and they don't, they need more space, so mm -hmm. they, they have to sell their Habitat house. And then a new family comes in and they haven't, like you said, put in the sweat equity. And so I'm curious how they sort of like buy into the sort of uh, philosophy that the community, whether it's three houses or six houses or 14 houses, how that works. Yeah. Well, I, can I speak sure, to that? Please, Just sure. I think um, one of the things that we put into place um, in each of the communities, <clears throat> community settings where there's multiple homes, we have a homeowners association. So that becomes a mechanism to help draw people together and look at any issues that come up, for example. And I think to the point of, you know, what is our interaction, if there's questions that come up around the homeowners association or, you know, I've had questions, Kathy, about, you know, people want to add solar and so I've just kind of fallen into that spot and having those questions come to me and we're there, you know, to um, point them in the right direction. I think, you know, over time the expectation is they're going to be able to do more and more on their own as they mature as homeowners and they mature as homeowner associations, but we're there to help guide them. But selling a house, um, they could sell it on the open market is what you're saying though. So when if as they, long as it's yes meets the requirements they, having to do with the mortgage. They contact Habitat usually first. Yes. They have to contact the town. Well they do have to contact Habitat first. Yep. They, they, okay. We have first right of refusal on most of Yeah, not all deeds. not all not deeds. all it's complicated in the <laughs> yeah. sense and, and it's, it's complicated <laughs> yeah. because early deeds were one thing. A yeah. yeah. lot less monitoring. Then we had um, deeds that were created through the Cape Cod Commission and Home, mm -hmm. and there was oversight there, you know, about that. And um, so that there's definitely um, notification to Habitat under that particular deed, notification to the county, notification to the town. Um, and then with some of our recent, there's notification to DHCD and the town but Habitat isn't necessarily notified of all of those sales. 
Typically, though, because we have a close relationship with Renee Hammond at the county and a close relationship with Gail Kelleher at Hack, we do hear about these. And so we're involved on the periphery of even the most recent ones. But you don't try to, like, uh, offer up a pool of potential buyers when someone wants to sell? Um, I would say we don't. We don't, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't we don't habitize the second. Yeah. Well, no, I'm just because, I'm just yeah. curious as yeah, to no, how yeah, that yeah. works. Well, usually, yeah. what we'll do is so usually, someone will call in and we'll say, "Talk to Beth." <laughs> <laughs> Beth will say, "I'll read the deed, <laughs> read the deed, decide you know what is the situation, make sure everything is followed, and advise." So mostly it's advisory. You know, we, we let them know what the responsibilities are, um, and then it's we we like it to be out of our hands. You know, when we're done, we want to be done. Um, so we don't get to know the person that comes in to buy. And, and for many of our earlier homes that have been sold, it's not in the bigger neighborhoods. A lot of the beginning of Habitats was one here, two there. Mm -hmm. You know, now we will see where, well, there's a new family moving into this neighborhood of eight homes and everyone's known everyone forever since they built. So, you know, it's a different dynamic, but it really won't involve us. Mm -hmm. okay. But these resale homes, do they have to go to someone who would meet the same income? The, yes, the same income profile. And so who um, makes yeah. those decisions? So that's up that's overseen by the Department of Housing. So so right now the process is when there is a resale, Gail Kelleher, who's at Community Real Estate, which is at HAC, Housing Assistance Corporation, in Hyannis, manages the resales on these properties. So she's extremely well versed in the process. And um, until recently, she was using a ready-to-buy list, which means she had pre-qualified people and then would just have to go back and, and determine, uh, like we do, that they still meet qualifications if a house becomes available. Um, my understanding is they are likely, or they are, or are likely to go back to a lottery process as these homes are becoming available. So there will be people qualified and then put into a lottery situation. Um, so there's definitely oversight. I mean, it's really a pretty tight process between what Gail's doing on the qualification level and then DHCD is making the, the approval of that uh, family. Yeah. Carol, anything? Any questions? No, no Lena, I think Joe wants to speak. Oh. I didn't see your hand go up. No, oh, okay. I, I didn't raise it, and I always want to speak. <laughs> um, but I didn't want to interrupt the dialogue um, because it's been fantastic. Um, I would like to sort of uh, circle back on some of the questions um, about the permanent uh, deed restrictions and what happens. Um, and there was a question that you would ask, Kathy, that I want to make sure I think I'm answering as well um, over here, and I apologize. Dave? Dave. Yep, thank you. Good, I remembered. Um, <clears throat> the thing that I want to emphasize is as Habitat has presented, they're talking about permanent deed restrictions and permanent deed restrictions that impact upon the town's shy list or subsidized housing inventory. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a critical piece for us to know. And it's ownership, because we deal in the town with two types, rental and ownership. And so um, in the just over three years that I've been here, we had uh, three inquiries, and I think it was the Homes Program, whereby uh, the original owners who were under deed restriction were able to sell and the buyer had to demonstrate through their mortgage, um, so we usually hear from the bank, is this still deed restricted? Is the town still in this program? And so um, for the older programs, we've been getting that sort of catch as catch can, but as, as Beth has said, the programs are more modern now where we're in constant communication with DHCD, and in fact, um, and I think you may know and, and your chair would know from the trust meetings, we're getting back into looking at those properties on the shy list and what actions the town should take. And so there is that per the perpetuity of uh, income restriction and affordability. And mercifully, the programs that have been around for 20 and 30 years still work in that regard. But we're more tied into it now with DHCD, with Habitat, with the banks to make sure that those properties continue on as affordability 
and the new buyers understand all of the restrictions that go with that. So it usually starts, if we don't hear it formally from DHCD, it's usually a panicked banker who's trying to do the mortgage and the closing and they need something from the town. And as memory serves, like I said, over the last three years, we've probably had three to five. Mm -hmm. And then if you're ready, willing, and able for me to add more commentary, I'd love to. Otherwise, I'm prepared to sit down and shut up. <laughs> the power is yours, Madam Chair. You may continue. Um, uh, thank you. And um, I also wouldn't want you folks to leave. Um, Wendy was good enough to let Jamie and I know that um, Sarah Hughes and the team from WBZ TV yeah, were there yesterday, so the snippet is set up. And um, I love nothing better than setting up a video and sitting down. <laughs> um, but before I do that, I, I just want to put out there, um, and this is predominantly as town administrator. I'm not even going to get into my role as chair of the trust. But November 17, 2022, was an amazing day. And it was an amazing day for housing. And it was an amazing day for Harwich. Um, being there yesterday in the cold but in the beautiful sunshine, we welcomed six new houses and a neighborhood into our town. But we welcomed 11 adults, 11 children, six families. And at the risk of getting emotional because it is so powerful and we are in this month of Thanksgiving, uh, when you see the, um, the video, you know, the very first dedication, the family get up and talked, and, you know, there's one who works in early child care and education. You've heard the board is talking about the needs that we have. So there's somebody that's helping in that realm. Um, the husband in that family works at one of our resorts, and we need that. We need people to work at the resorts to keep people coming here to continue to get the revenue that support our other programs. And so in every instance yesterday, there are these great stories. And so to be able to see those folks and just being present, I mean, any of us that had a starter home when there was such a thing, you remember the joy, you remember the fear, you remember the emotion. And seeing it yesterday for all six families was absolutely um, a joyous occasion and, and one that um, I joked with your chair that I was going to be here this morning <laughs> to make sure you cleared the room for my meeting at 10. Yes. Um, but really, I wouldn't have missed this. Yeah, I wouldn't have missed this discussion this morning. Uh, and then, last but not least, as as you folks from Habitat have talked about, um, every part of your program is community. And I was struck yesterday, and I don't want to get into any names or anything, but the home sponsors, you know, just the the effort and and the impact that they make. It's just, um, I'm getting emotional. It is remarkable. And so, you know, the goal for us in the town is to build off of that joy yesterday and recognize that the problem is still there, but there's so much we can do. So thank you for the chance to say that, Madam Chair. Thank you, folks at Habitat and everybody that was associated with Murray Lane. What a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, and if I may, cue the video that I had nothing to do with. <laughs> for a lot of first-time home buyers to be able to afford a place. Which is why the ceremony we joined today was so meaningful. Thanks to a very generous community and Habitat for Humanity of Cape Cod, six families, including one that lost everything years ago, are celebrating a dream come true. Make this house a home. A show of support for new families in West Harwich. This home dedication is a welcome that replaces years of struggle. Still processing this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Like it's yeah. real. Yeah. 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 For Alfred and Arellis Reyes and their three children, moving to this cozy cul-de-sac marks the end of a long road that starts in Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria blasted the island in 2017 and they lost everything. Rough time, no power, no food, no basic things. Amid dedication, they found the courage to make a leap, moving so Alfred could become a chef on Cape Cod. But initially, that meant living alone. Me not being able to, to bring them here, like, it was emotional because you know, my world was shattering. Two years ago, on their third try, Habitat for Humanity drew their name in the lottery. They've been looking to this moment ever since. It's for people really in need. It's, it's from people really care about families. Homes are so meaningful. 
President and CEO Wendy Cullinan says with just one paid supervisor on this site, hundreds of volunteers made this possible. It's the best sense of community. They come two or three times a week. It's a community that they want to see these families get into their homes, and they're making friends along the way. I didn't know there was people so good in the yeah. world that, you know, that can help, you know, people like us. The volunteers, you're awesome. You are our heroes. The homeowners also put in sweat equity. That's their down payment. 250 work hours per adult, which also builds relationships. We didn't only work in our house. No. We're working in other houses. And you have stories about their houses. Oh, I made your closet. You know that? House proud and hopeful, Alfred and Arellis call this the forever home they couldn't have imagined. We were like, we're never going to buy a house, you know, in Cape Cod. Never. And yeah. We have it because of Habitat. Oh my goodness! That is awesome! <laughs> Already sharing memories, even before they move into this neighborhood of friends. And they should all be in by Christmas. Incredibly, when one homeowner had a change of plans, Habitat picked the next name in the lottery. That family in the neighborhood also from Puerto Rico and also lost everything in Hurricane Maria. And by the way, they start a veterans bill next year in Brewster. They're raising money for that now. That will also be powerful. And I can't wait to see you do that story as well. To see, I mean, when you get a home, it's so exciting. You can just see the joy on their face. And they never That's thought right. they'd have one. Yeah. Great publicity. Most good bet. The hats are a nice touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I have a quick question about okay. the land. Um, okay, go ahead. So, I know you prefer more density, um, a more dense project because of utilities and expenses and stuff like that. So, what um, size, uh, you know, acreage are you looking for as sort of minimum? Because there just seems to be less and less land available, especially since we've had such an increase in building costs and developers buying up what's left. Yeah, I think. I think uh, I I think what we would be looking for, as Wendy has said, you know, between six and ten homes are really our sweet spot, yeah. so to speak. So I think it would be a conversation with the town as to what what size land through 40B uh -huh. do they think would be doable through mm -hmm. that process. You know, we're working with another municipality, and it's a very large piece of land, very large. But because of some um, issues with the property, there's only a small portion that we can utilize. Mm -hmm. So although it's, you know, 10 acres plus, yeah. we probably can only get six to eight homes on the yeah. front portion of it. So it's, it's pretty site contingent, I would say. I think in general, if we have an acre, we can put multiple homes on oh. it. What's the Murray Lane um, acreage? So I think the average, I wrote it down actually. So it's, what we built the houses on was 58,637 square feet. So over an acre. Um, but um, the average lot size there is 9,773 square feet. Oh, okay. All right, so a little less than a quarter of an acre. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. mm -hmm. I don't and know if that we're helps. Happy to donate back to op to open space land that we can't build on. Um, well, that's the situation mm -hmm. in Dennis. Dennis yeah. um, it's a uh, there's um, it's zone zone two, so we're limited to the number of bedrooms. So we're peeling off some of the nitrogen credits from a portion of the land to um, create density with those four houses right off of Setucket Road, right behind the council, what was the Council on Aging yeah. Center for Active Living. And the portion of that lot across the easement, uh, we are going to donate back to the town as open space. Um, mm -hmm. It was presented to the select board as an option and they very much like that idea. And in fact, it will be a condition of the permitting. Would you prefer that, I mean, obviously the land either be donated or the town purchase it? Donated if they can. <laughs> if, so we'll, we'll go through the RFP process, um, certainly to acquire town-owned land through that process. Um, see, 
we often, we just with this Dennis portion, um, we have an under agreement with the Friends of Dennis Senior Citizens and they've given us uh, really what turns out to be a habitat friendly price. And then we went to CPC for the acquisition funds. So, you know, it was $341,000 that the town is now, it was approved at the fall town meeting and we'll move forward with the purchase after we permit it. But we can't purchase market rate land. We just would build yeah. a house every, you know, so right. often. So mm -hmm. our model is to, you know, secure the land through the, either the city so if you needed or? like four, minimum of four acres or something to, to do a project. Yeah. But you're saying you did Murray Lane on like less than an acre and a half. Or a little over. Yeah. Well, yeah, amazing. Amazing. yeah. 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 Wow. And it doesn't, and it's a sweet spot. I mean, it doesn't feel overbuilt. I no, think it doesn't, no, it's right? great. It's, you know, I was at a conference, Beth and I were at a conference last week or the week before and um, about this topic. And, you know, one, one solution was the multifamily homes to be building, you know, the five unit homes instead of, you know, basically instead of the single family home ownership. But, you know, our, our, our thoughts and our feeling, what we like to stand behind at Habitat is the, the sense of owning your own home and your own property. So when your little boy wants to go out back and dig that hole to China, <laughs> or the other lady wants her prized rose bushes and don't kick my, the soccer, and we see it even with our common wall homes that we've done in the past, it's just mm -hmm. like a little bit of space makes good neighbors. Mm -hmm. And we want, you know, our message, and we're so happy that you wanted to talk to us today because we want you to know that we're not building haphazardly. Mm -hmm. Like we're very, very thoughtful about the quality of our homes, mm -hmm. um, working in partnership with the towns, um, being good neighbors, putting good citizens in your town, educating them. Um, but that, that, you know, that, that's just owning your own property like we've all had that opportunity to do in life. Mm -hmm. it, there's something, you know, a little bit better about that. And it's also the, you know, the character of the cake, right? We're not like three-story multi, you know, that's not what people expect on the Cape. So we you know, we love the Cape, that's why we live here. I love open space. I live next door to 84 acres of conservation land in Sandwich. I, I love Cape Cod, I would never wanna leave. So um, so we're, we're careful and thoughtful about our process and about our decisions and, um, and, and so appreciative of the community that supports what we do. Well, thank you for being here this morning and as our name is real estate and open space, uh, it's our charge to make recommendations to the select board uh, properties, whether they're suitable for housing or conservation or municipal use or whatever. So even though we don't actually have a piece of land that we could make available to you, we can, through the board of select board, make recommendations as to property that might be suitable and also with our affordable housing trust uh, you know make recommendations to them so we appreciate your being here with us it's certainly uh great to hear all this information and i think we're, we're all very supportive of the work you do and wish you well in all your future endeavors thank so you. thank you so much thank you thank very much thank you. appreciate it thank you everybody nice to see you thank you Okay, uh, Chair's report real quick. Uh, we did have the uh, auction of the low lands of low value. Um, the first auction went very well. I guess you all saw it in the paper that uh, those properties were, were sold. And almost 300 and uh, almost $400,000, uh, you know, was gained by the town and at least five properties back on the tax roll list. Uh, the, the ones that were not sold at the first auction were auctioned off last Wednesday, oh. day before yesterday, and uh, one property uh, was sold that day. So uh, now the unsold properties will revert back to town, will revert to town ownership, mm -hmm. and then the town can decide uh, what uh, they will do with them. Uh, there is still interest from people who would like to purchase some of them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that would be, as I understand it, Mr. Town Administrator, that would be through a RFP process at that point for people who might want to acquire? Uh, correct. We expect that um, because there's a different um, procurement process that went on with the, the auction, anything that's left over, the town would have to purposely say that it's surplus and then go 30B. Mm -hmm. 
do you know how long it's going to take before the town would have the ability to do that? Well, I, I we think... We're talking a couple months? Or? Um, I think what would happen is, well, um, the process before the board would be pretty quickly after uh, determination by the treasurer collector as, as to what was left over. So that's, you know, a fairly quick agenda item, say, probably in January. Um, what I would then think is the town may want to contemplate transferring that um, to another department or if we want to do the trust or somebody so that might require town meeting uh, approval otherwise they could dispose of it under 30 B okay All right. good yeah so so that went well yeah. right yeah. that was good, good. Uh, uh, madam uh, chair thank you for your efforts on that I do appreciate uh, you making me aware of that okay. um, so we could finally get that moving it was a little disconcerting that you know, we were made aware of the properties in January, and that, that kind of process shouldn't take a full year. So thanks for the heads up. You're very welcome. Anytime I can help, you know. I'm available. Uh, I, further, I've attended the uh, Affordable Housing Trust meeting uh, October 24th, and then just uh, this past Monday on the 14th. Um, and you had uh, uh, Jen, Gols Jen Golson. Yep. Uh, from J.M. Golson, who is going to do their action plan, and uh, it, her her presentation was very good. I mean, it just showed, planned out her timing uh, as to when things are going to happen. And I guess you're as you process through this, uh, the next uh, community forum thing will probably be in April. Uh, we're targeting that. April or May, depending upon you know what's going on with town meeting plus the weather. Um, but no, I couldn't agree more with what you said. We're excited to get uh, Jen and her firm back in with the trust. Um, as you folks probably know, uh, the town had the, um, her firm under contract and um, March of 2020, they had to give up the project. She wasn't sure what was gonna happen to her business because of pandemic. And so um, on the one hand, we're four and a half years into being a trust and not having an action plan. On the other hand, we're a government, we're immortal, we'll live forever, so we'll get it done. Um, better also, to get it done than to There's also a second it. plan being developed for the property on Pleasant Lake. So one of the members did it. ask that uh, Ms. Gouldson and her efforts on our action plan also be mindful of that. I will tell you that I'm gonna have or expand beyond that. Um, I, as you may have heard at our meeting, um, I'm gonna be sharing with her the properties that town meeting gave to the trust that we just this year got under deed mm -hmm. uh, and other properties that we're aware of. So she'll incorporate the Pleasant Lake Avenue properties for sure, but several others. Okay, good. Yep. Uh, Kathy, you were also at that meeting. Any any comments or anything you want to? Uh, we can move right into member reports. Uh, any news from <laughs> community <laughs> preservation? Because that was part of the trust meeting also, just trying to tie it together. Oh. Um. The uh, rescinding the... Uh, we finally gave our, your money back. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not... You know, they don't need to know that. Real estate open space is not involved in that, you know, with the rescission of the money, really. Well, it was just, you know. So, I mean, in terms of community preservation, um, committee, um, we met in November and had our first set of um, applicants come, and we, you know, had some discussion... We have two other meetings planned in December, December 8th and the following week. And uh, we'll go through all the applications and then we'll probably deliberate on those applications in January. Okay. Um, so, Good. and as you know, uh, we have a letter of support in with one of the applications, which is going to be dealt with in executive session. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Okay. Good. Good. Um, I have nothing else. Uh, anyone else have uh, anything going on with your local? Uh, the the plan, local planning committee had um, had another meeting in October or in early November, and getting started and looking at um, scopes of work for um, uh, uh, getting a consultant on board. So that it we're it's in the research phase on that. Good. Okay. Anyone else? Dave. All I can say is there are the maps. Um, oh, yeah, I was going to ask I, you. I did get the uh, shape files from the, the assessors. And spent a whole lot of time putting them together and found out there was a whole bunch of data missing. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and so I grabbed it from uh, the state. 
they had some stuff from September. It differs from what I got from the assistant. And it was one of these typical mm -hmm. things. I got, I got three data sets and mm -hmm. they don't match. Um, and uh, so I'm actually meeting with the acting assessor uh, after this meeting. Oh, okay. And we'll try to figure out which one I should trust. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the only one who's trying to do this. Uh, I've been working with a, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I've been working with a, a GIS expert from this volunteer in the trust. And Harvard <coughs> Conservation Trust, and um, he's very good, but he needed the data as well. Mm -hmm. And it was together as we were working around saying, well, you know, he's questioning, well, I can't do this. And then I look at the data, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Things, you know, match like this. And so, um, yeah, I'm going back to ground zero uh, once I figure out which data set I should use, and I'm going to have to start correcting data that's out there in the public domain that, you know, I don't know. Well, <coughs> trying to, try to come up with something. We have a better, much better methodology uh, mm -hmm. going forward. So, um, was there any follow-up with uh, Dan Pelletier from the Water Department as far as uh, did, uh, did he contact you about getting any information? Of we we've chatted. What I, he's I, put I've together. I've sent him information and so okay. forth. And then you know, but it's hard for me to to, to say anything to him because the, the inconsistencies in the data just make it hard. Okay. I don't want to say, hey, this is available or this is not available. Okay. All right, good. Thank well, thank you so much because I know you put a lot of time and effort into yeah. doing all that. And it's, it's not just a benefit to this committee. It's a benefit to the town. What, what yeah. you're doing is, uh, it, you know, is it great. Was, uh, it's available to the department offices if they want, if they want it. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, our next meeting, uh, if we stay on schedule, is December 16th. That's kind of getting close to the holidays. I'm wondering if you would care to move it back a week to the 9th, put a little further away before the Christmas, or whether we decide to even have a meeting at all. If we have nothing really pressing on an agenda, we, we may uh, pass on that. But it's, it's up to you all. Uh, Kathy, your feelings? Well, do we have anything um, immediate on the agenda? Uh, not so far. Uh, I can't do it on the 9th. Okay, all right. I so maybe there's wait no till need. January. Uh, are we, do we want to put it off till January? We're fine with that. Yeah. Dave, are you? If you don't, if, you know, I don't. Have, I won't have anything. If it's anything, you know, if I have the maps ready, I will just simply send out an email. All right. Let's so well, we can wait till January then, okay. if need be. If anything comes up, we can always post it. Okay. But as it stands right now, see you next year. Okay. <laughs> What's that date? <laughs> I love, uh, I love that. I love that. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is, we'll, we'll come up with it, Carol. Yeah. So. I move that we uh, adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank yeah. you all, and please have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Enjoy. Thank